presentation on optimizing space and reducing power. We're going to lay the foundation of how the project comes together through these four um, panelists' papers. This will be followed by an open panel discussion before we open up for a Q&A. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat box and I'll bring them up during the Q&A session. We also request that you complete a short survey at the end of the webinar. The webinar, I'm very pleased to say, will also be on YouTube. I would now like to take the opportunity to introduce our four panelists. We have from ACC Trans Solutions, Mr. Ding, who is the, sorry, who is a technical specialist in supply chain and warehouse solutions, and he designs for multinational corporations and SMEs in Southeast Asia. He will be followed by Ms. Lim, who's the project manager of CWR Resources, who are a member of the Cycle World Group of Companies. She takes a lead role in planning and project management. This will be followed by Vincent Ung, who is the country manager for SSI Shea for Malaysia. He has been involved in planning and implementation of warehouses in Malaysia for numerous industries, including the coal industry. This will then be all tied together by Mr. Chu, who is the technical director of NRS Process Systems. He has been involved in design and engineering, engineering and cooling systems and freezing systems for over 30, I think it's 35 years, Mr. Chu, not 33, but I'll go with 33. These will be your panelists for today. And I would now like to hand over to Mr. Ding, who will start the first, pro, um, the first paper, which is conceptual design. Mr. Ding, over to you. Mr. Ding, I'm not hearing you, sir. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, I'm new now. Good, thanks, Johnny, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so today, the first thing that I would like to share with you, um, I let's start with this. When I was studying back in 1990s, uh, we have to learn how to draw engineering drawing on paper manually because that time we, we, the AutoCAD still not that famous and everybody need to learn how to draw with their hands. And the most difficult part that we will see when we actually start the drawing is not about you actually how to draw it, but the first thing is that you how you place the first thought on the papers because if you did this wrongly, everything will be screwed up. You know, your, your everything will be screwed aside or you know you don't have enough space to to develop your drawing. So I during that time, actually I make myself a thought process in how actually I can define my first thought. And from there, it will always work very well. So, you know, the same things will go on our project plannings on how we actually kickstart a, a warehouse design, you know, when we want to start an automated warehouse or even a manual warehouse. When we want to do a project planning, when we want to start, we need to make it right from the start and you have to have the right thought process. So today I'll share with you the thought process that I call it inside out at first, which I will always use in the design of everything when I start. What is mean by inside out? As the picture you can see in here, the first thing that I show you at here is that the functions. What is mean by function? That means that you will need to understand what is the operation functions that we require within the four walls of our warehouse in general, you can follow the following questions that below. You know, first, how is you going to do your receiving? Will it be a full pallet, a full cases picking, uh, receiving, or do you have piece receiving as well? You know, sometimes because you are dealing with some e-commerce, you may have that. So, the, how about the receiving traffic and matters when they receive? How you going? Is it the trucks that coming in in containers? Will there be any receiving trucks in small size 
20 ton or 10 ton or even 5 tons, you know, each of it will have, have a very different kind of approach. Then subsequently, how are we going to do a picking? You know, you have full pallet pick, that is easy, but you do, will you have a case pick as well and even up to inner pick? And how is all the structure against the picking methods? You know, all this when you can define it, it will make you have a better clear pictures about how your things were going on. So how are we going to keep our inventory on or storage, any incubation period? This is more about our inventory that we keep it within the warehouse because warehouse is all about inventory storage. You know? Do when we how we want to keep our inventory and storage, any incubation period. How about the environment? Will it be a freezing environment, a chill environment? Do you need any humidity control? Do you need, when they are in stock, stock area, do you need any value added services for it? So how, and lastly, how are we going to have a dispatch of that goods? How are we going to handle it in fellas, cases or pieces? You know, how about the dispatch truck, traffic and methods? And all this is the essential functions that we can see within the four walls of the warehouse. But you know what importance further is that you need to identify it now and then you need to quantify it. The quantify is always the most difficult part of each of these functions because you need to really have some numbers. You need to have some range that you know you, you're roughly where you're looking at. After you quantify the functions, after you quantify the function, we will we will do the equipment selection from the quantifications of the functions. Now we spell the specification of the equipment. We can spell the specific equipment that is suitable for our functions. For storage, you, when you have the, 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 you quantify the functions, that, you, know, you need how many pallet locations, what, what, what is the weight, what is the, what is the size of the, the storage that you're going to have. Then you can easily define what kind of racking you're going to use, what kind of mobile, if it is mobile racking or selective pallet racking or even ASIS rackings, you know, you can, you can define from that. Then, you know, the environment control, when you actually define the environment control, what kind of the, the refrigeration system you're going to choose, you can actually define from that. Then more important is that when you have that, the most crucial within the warehouse is about the entire logistic between the four walls. When we talk about the intra logistic, we always have a lot of choice that we can choose a, a, across conveyors, AGV, or some material handling equipment like forklift, electric pallet vehicle, pallet jack, and etc. So subsequently, you will move further from there. You will move further to see um, the, about the building. We will talk about the building. This is where we need to start communicating with the construction team or the civil engineering team. We define the floor loading. You know, when you have the all the load that, you know, pallets, stack on each other, you know, uh, you have pallet racking, then we can actually know what is the floor loading. This is the times that we actually handle all this information to the serial account or the construction team. Then they will actually design from there. Then because we have all the equipments that we selected earlier, you know, now we can easily consolidate and actually have a rated power, you know, define and give, give it to the M&E where actually we need this, this, all this power and where is the DB box that we want it to be. Then the MNE can design subsequently according to that. Then you know we talk to the architect as well, how you want to access to the, to the warehouse, you know, at the anti room area, at the co-room area, at each of the uh, operation process area, you know. Then you actually were able to talk to the architect and they will actually put the access door accordingly. Then we can actually define it together. Likely there will be changes requests from all the, 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 the our, our counterpart architect, m and &E, or software engineer, which will impact our previous specifications on our equipment. So the close collaborations will definitely be needed between both sides. We, we, we just need to work together with them to nail down all the, all the de details together. Lastly, the architect will wrap the whole environment, hold the whole building with the environment, together with the environment, with facade and you know, all the surrounding area. And that will give you the whole concept of a project. You may ask me for right now, you know, sometimes if a lot of people, you will see that they actually find a building, then they actually do outside in because they have the building already. Uh, then they, they, they start to define the process and everything inside within the four walls and that becomes a constraint. Sure, you can do that. There is no right or wrong when how, how you actually define that, but you may need to go through a longer process on the designing and you may end up 
some of the functions that you are request, you're not able to do it, and which is required by your, your business operations. That will give you some kind of um, giving out on the operations. Okay. So now we actually move further. After we understand about the thought process, now we look a little bit deeper, deeper into the conceptual design. If you think a little bit deeper when we talk about the thought process just now, you will realize that the first step in our thought process inside out is about actually all the operation, operation fundamentals. What we are trying to define is operation process, how the, the process link to each other, then material flow diagram, when they actually link already, how the, the, the material is flow from one, one function to another functions. And then, you know, you need to hold, have the, uh, what we call the information flow as well, which is what we call the IT architecture. So when you have that all, you actually have a backbone. You have the backbone for the whole, whole warehouse because this is, this is what the most crucial within the four walls that you want to have. In a lot of occasions, you, you may not able to provide the information that we request but actually, you don't need to worry about that. That is where actually sometimes we will actually ask about, talk about data. Today, we all everybody talk about big data. So if you have the data that you know collected from, from your, your trans business transactions for the past one year, we actually can easily help you to do the data analysis to do some kind of uh, identifications as well as quantifications to fit how, how it should be fit in short, is how it should be designed so that it can fit the operation perfectly. And definitely, we can simulate from there further consideration your business development strategy. That means that, that because when we actually do the data analysis, that means that if, let's say, this warehouse is built two or three years ago and in, in, in how it performed in last year. But if you considering that, you know, moving down, what you should consider is your business development strategy. How are you going to expand your business? Are you going to do expand it according to, 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 to expand your, your customer base or each of the customers, you're not going to expand your customer base. You may expand your customer itself. You know, if your customer itself is expanding, that will also help you in terms of expanding the, so you need to define all these business strategy. Then you actually will able to have a more perfect estimations for futures. What is going to happen there? In other occasions, you may also, you may, you may, may say that you are new in the cold storage or warehouse business and you don't have the past one year data or, or any historical data for to be analyzed. Then what we should do is that we will do a benchmarking based on your business model and then we will plan according to that. That means that we will benchmark against someone in the markets and we'll take that as a benchmark and then we design according to that. Definitely, that will be some more uh, discussions, you know, because the business models that when we actually plan we need to really look into it and discuss with you and how on how actually it should be done. During st this stage of design, we should able to take into consideration, we need to, we, we, we should take into all the consideration of what I mean, I call a restrictions. Restriction is something that, you know, when, when you, is, is, is something given. So when you have a piece of land, that is some restrictions. So for example, the time we talk about, if you have a building already there, that means that you still can do inside out, but the building itself becomes a restriction to your design. You know, it becomes on top of the fundamentals, everything's already. So this is this is what some things that you should take into consideration. Some things other than, than, than the lens you, know, you will you will see in restriction is like rules and regulations, you know, some of the some of the, the restrictions in constructions, you no, know, like you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. The height of the building is definitely like that. The restriction from the government says that you cannot have this, you need to have these eight meters of pullback areas. You know, and so, so this is all about restrictions. So now with the, the thought process of inside out, we can develop building solutions as spoken that earlier. Then we start to discuss with the construction team. At this stage, it would be good if you can start to evaluate do an evaluations on the after we have a building concept design already. We should what we should have is a staffing and also related financial analysis. So you should able to do a staffing analysis. You know how many people that you're going to involve and what kind of capex and opex that you're going to have look into. This will give you an overview. What is the future operation performance from 
the business perspective, not from the operation perspective already, but from the business perspective. Because when we actually start all this eventually, we need it need, need the business to be sustainable. So when you want a business to be sustainable, you need to look into from the business perspective. Definitely, we should able to further fine tune the operations right now, as well as related business strategy to align together them so that we can actually move the business and the operation together. So you don't have a mislink there. So after we talk all about this, uh, I would like to share with you what uh, is important is our ultimate goal. You know what? We do so many things on that. Our ultimate goal is only one thing. Basically, our ultimate goal from a business investment perspective is not to automate the solutions, just to say to automate it. We are automating the solutions to increase the value of our business. We want to make things simple and we want to create, you know, uh, the lower our OPEX, you know, it may, we may need to pay a little bit more on KPEX, but we want to lower our OPEX and make everything to be simple and less risk for our business. As shown here in the charts here, you can see that we are considering a two key axis in here. The first axis is about the cost and the second axis on, on, uh, y, uh, on X directions is about the levels of technology or I call it level of automation as well. We don't want to over automate it as well as we don't want to under automate it. When you over automate it, where you can see from here, you will have a high, when you over automate it, that means that you will have a high capex. And you may save slightly on OPEX, but you eventually, when you over automate, you need to pay a lot and your capex will be high. But on the other hand, if you under automate it, that means that you still keep a very high OPEX but your, your, your KPEX may be slightly lower. So what we want to land is at the sweet spot where, where I call a solution zone. We want to land there so that optimally, optimi op optimally we, are, we are there so that we don't over automate and not under automate. So this we're only able to see when we actually evaluate it, evaluate it from the business uh, analysis perspective. So, uh, to have a discussion today, to the panel conference discussion today. Uh, actually, I agree with both the other panelists, uh, Mr. Chiu, uh, Adi, and as well as Vincent, that, you know, to have a layout of a piece of land without any solid basic fundamental, I have developed into three different solutions here. We have a three different types of automation levels as well as their investment is very different. The first one that you can see at, on, the, on, the, on the screen here is the is a, uh, is a conventional warehouse with normal pallet selective racking in multiple rooms. This is quite common in the old days for the party logistics that when they actually go into this uh, cold storage warehouse industry, uh, as the customer requests them, not able to, to, to have certain confidential, you know, people cannot see their product, their operations. But bear in mind that these operations is very human dependence. You know, the people need to walk into the cold room and do a lot of work inside that. You know, it's quite tedious, especially uh, in a cold storage warehouse. Today, it's quite difficult to find labels to, to support these kind of operations. Um, the other second solutions that you can see at here um, is about a mobile racking solutions. A lot of third-party logistics after from the, the selective parallel racking, they actually move into this, uh, what we call a higher storage density uh, storage method. The, 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 this, is, this will need some kind of what we call resource sharing, which is quite famous today is that people, everybody is talking about resources sharing. The manpower usage here will be crucial here, will still be crucial. You know, it, it still depends on humans to go into the core room to do all the, all the activities that are inside, at, in, inside that. We are considering a sharing space and resources here compared to the first solutions that you've seen earlier. So it may help you to drive your OPEX OPEX further down because the sharing resources and also, you know, place are sharing compared to the first solutions. But this is still, bear in mind that this is still some, some sort of human dependent solutions. And for the next one, you can see here, the third one is an ASI solution in Asia. Today, this is getting more popular. But bear in mind that this is not a new technology or, or a lot of people think that it's, it's something very new. But frankly, in, back in 19... Uh, 80 or 1990s, there is already a, a lot of ASRS in Europe uh, um, 
in, in Europe. So today, it, 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 the, 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 the technology has come to Asia and Asia is booming a lot in ASRS solutions. In Asia, solution is getting this more popular. It will help to increase the density of the storage as well as increase the throughput of the solutions, the throughput of the and performance. The automation level is high here uh, when you no longer need humans to go into the code. Everybody will keep outside. Everything will come out automatically. OPEX may be further driven, further down compared to the second. And the, the, the high density storage will also give you some kind of advantage as well in terms of storage costs. But depends on your operations and your, your uh, compare second on how you, your, you want to operate it. Later, Vincent's uh, Miss Lim Mr. Chiu will further explore, uh, explore with you and further discuss with you about each of these solutions, you know, from their, their specialist perspective in equipment, installation, panel, and refrigeration systems. And as a summary, generally, this is an overview after you put all the solutions as they are specification together side by side and compare. We take the option one, which is the conventional solution as a baseline. If you take that as a baseline, you will see easily see that mobile racking will give you a, a, around 60 to 80% of increment of storage while steep, but it's still a human dependent. So that won't be any too much of, of saving in terms of human power. So you won't see any improvement in terms of the throughput performance here. Operator will still go in the freezing room and they will still work like that. Definitely you can you can incorporate it with some other solutions, you know, automated solutions to, to reduce that. That is something possible where we call a, a, a something form between all hybrid solutions. While the ASRS, which is the third option, will able to give you a more than 100% of incremental of storage depends on the heart that you are designing. Beside that, the throughput performance can also be increased at least 70 to 100% if an advantage that the operator no longer required to go in a freezing zone. So you actually don't need to, because when, when the labels go in the freezing area, normally you will need to pay some additional uh, bonus or, or what we call the allowance for them. So now if they, you no longer have people go inside, this will be something that you can save in your OPEX. So with that, I would like to end my presentation. I hope this presentation will be able to give you some clues about how if you, you would like to kickstart a project that is involved in a, in a, a storage, cold storage warehouse design, so you can actually uh, think from this perspective and consider it. And if you need anything, feel free to contact me. And now I would like to pass it back to Johnny. Thanks, Johnny. Thank, uh, Mr. Ding, thank you very much for that. So, Jay, before we move on, I'd just like to clarify a few points or, or, or summarize, I should say. Are you advocating that the client should have a, a firm business plan before they start? And also that the three options that you presented all have merits? In short, it is yes. From solution perspective, there is always no obsolete right or wrong between the, each of the solutions. What important here is, is how we actually drive the solution to align to our business operations and the business model, your business strategy, and checking it against your fine from the financial perspective. ASIS is a trend that's getting popular in the region now, but I don't think that everybody will need to do an ASIS. What are people expecting to lend uh, a label a, a, a label to be more costly? You know, at this area now, the, the labor cost is increasing. That's why actually people are expecting the land and the labor cost increase, but we are expecting that that happens. That's why ASRS become uh, more as more, more popular. But eventually you should go down and sit down and evaluate it from every of the fundamentals and also the financial perspective to and make additions on that. That is what where actually I, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing. Thank you, Johnny. Okay. No, no, no. Thank you very much for that. I'm sure um, as the webinar goes on, there will be some questions coming in that we'll we'll talk about later on because we do want to fit this all together at the end of at the end of the day, as such. So. I'd, I'd now like to take the opportunity to introduce or, or ask Ms. Lim to present her paper on how cold room panels are an integral part of the overall solution and operational cost savings. So, Ms. Lim, over to you. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Johnny uh, and Mr. Ding. Okay, a very good day to all our ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for uh, attending today's uh, forum. Okay, for our constructions of a control, uh, temperature control rooms or the environment, we use the structural insulated panels, which is an IBS, industrialized building system. So these panels are actually all prefabricated in the factory and they are delivered to the site for fast assembly and also construction. So there will be very minimal uh, cutting unless it is needed. But if not, then there will be no cutting at all. So even during this uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic, a lot of these infectious hospitals and facilities, they are erected actually using this system. So with the high thermal insulation performance, it reduces the cost of heating and also the conditioning. So it and it's energy saving is a uh, fast insulation and also lightweight. So lighter foundation is actually also required. So besides and all having this uh, hygienic smooth surface kind of facing. So these insulated panels, these structural insulated panels, they can be a uh, polyurethane uh, PUR or polyisocyanuric PIR rigid foam. So for PIR, they are also like PUR. So it's known for the thermal efficiency. So these panels actually, they look the same, but PIR foam actually is also a type of rigid polyurethane foam, but it has an actually an improved fire resistant factor. So it only differs from pure polyurethane foam only in the ratio of the primary components that is the polio and also the isocyanates is the ratio of how they are being mixed. So, but then I'm not going to, into the chemistry of it. So, but for both PUR, and also PAR, these are thermal setting plastic. So they do not actually melt and they do not produce burning droplets under the effects of fire. So uh, for both PUR and PAR panels, these are classified as a uh, class O under the uh, malicious fire and rescue department, that is our bomba. So if you have any facility that is built with this material, so this is subjected to bomba inspections and also approval. So please take note on that. So, okay, these panels actually, they can come with a quite standard metal facing that is always the pre-painted galvanized iron sheet as PPGI. Normally it's white in color, but if you fancy any other colors then you can always request, but it, that will be subjected to the volume. So the substrate can also be other kind of material like stainless steel, you know, because this depends on your application because this is not only used in cold rooms. It can also be used in uh, hot rooms that use a very high temperature room, like dry clean room, fryer room, or even uh, food processing plants that uh, they have a lot of washing. They require a very hygienic environment or even clean rooms that produces these uh, electronic components and also uh, telco shelters that uh, house the sensitive telecommunication equipment inside. Okay, besides being low thermal conductivity, these panels are they are very stable and durable. So they are able to be freestanding uh, without to have any structural support for most of the application and also construction. But some are minimally uh, mounted to the structures. But a lot of people ask me, you know, Adi, how long is this panel going to last? You know, so for me, it will always function as long as your building stands, you know, I would say you will have a useful life spans beyond 50 years. But unless if you have so many uh, F1 drivers in your facility, then there will be another story. Okay? So, okay, depending on the temperature required, actually panels can be fabricated from 50 mm to even 250 mm thick. So, uh, but the way we actually manufacture our panels locally here in Malaysia, so actually the length can be as long as your transportation and also your handlings allows uh, for local projects. But then if for export, then your container size would be the limitation. So, okay, now if you look at the three conceptual options that we have, okay, all these three uh, options, actually the cold space is negative uh, 20 degrees Celsius. I would say that 150 mm thick shall be adequate. So I would say adequate from the aspect of thermal performance and also the structural strength. But if we upgrade it to 200 uh, mm thick, then it will definitely increase its energy saving factor. Okay, for option one, if you look at option one, this is actually a conventional selective uh, racking. So an option two, we actually conceptualize it with this uh, mobile racking. So these two options, one and two, they are only 12 meters high. So we do not require any structures for the wall panels. 
So even if it's 13 meter high, we do not require that. So these panels, all these wall panels, they shall be freestanding. So this is actually a very old school way of building a cold room. But now if you look at this option three, in option three, we are putting in ASRS, okay, for a height of 30 over meters. So this can actually be constructed with the conventional construction columns and also tie beams for the wall panels support and mounting. So whether this is a reinforced concrete columns or whether it's a fully steel columns, actually this will be depending on your consulting engineer's design because they also have other factors that they have to consider in like the, like the wind load, you know, and etc. So, okay, but the other way to uh, construct this option three is using the red clad system. So in red clad system, we'll be utilizing the racking to support the wall panels and the ceiling panels. So in this system, the racking is actually not only supporting the load of your store goods, but also the load of your building envelopes as the panels. So in the construction of a red clad, so first the racking will be assembled, then the building envelope, that's the panels, all then will be built around this racking structure until the whole warehouse is completed. So uh, there are actually um, pros and cons but between these two methods, but then I would say these are the possible and also the proven methods to construct it. So, okay, now we move to ceiling insulated panels. Okay, for ceiling insulated panels, in actual fact, these ceiling insulated panels, they will be actually hanged to the roof truss. Besides and just resting or being joined at the perimeter of the wall panels. So actually, there are informations that the way the loading and etc. you have to pre-inform to the structure consultant because they will be designing the roof truss. So the roof truss actually they have to design to cater for all these weights and whatever loads. So because above the ceiling panels, they are not only uh, the ceiling panels, there are other services as well like firefighting, like your electrical or your CCTV or even maybe some Michael Jackson doing moonwalking on the ceiling panels, you see. So there will be fixed load and also there'll be life load. Okay. Another area that we have to be properly insulated is the floor. Okay, this is an area where I would say a lot of energy will lose in a building because cold air is actually denser. So it settles onto the floor, it sinks. So the floor itself will be having its own uh, insulation. And the thickness again will be depending on your temperature required and also, but also the loading has to be considered. So high compressive strength load insulation. So it will be required in the options too that whereby we put in the mobile racking. So because underneath the mobile racking, the rail, we have to insulate it with the high compressive strength load insulation. So same goes with the option three, where, whereby we put in the ASRS. So the entire floor, the whole floor, will be actually on high compressive strength floor insulation. Because you do not want to have any structural failures on the floor. Because another layer of your reinforced concrete floor will be on top of your floor insulation. So will be also other loads from your rackings, from your goods, from your wrist truck, movement, vibration, and etc. Okay, for the floor, uh, frost heat will be actually an, another issue to be concerned of because so you can actually consider of having this uh, underneath floor ventilation by means of passive fans or even you can have it fan force. You know? But the basic principle is just to actually expel or remove the moisture laden in the subfloor. Okay, so these three areas, the wall, the ceiling, the floor, this has to be properly joined, you know constructed living without any thermal bridges. So this is where I would say right materials actually meet the right methods of insulation and also good workmanship. That if you really want to have energy saving temperature control facility. Okay, for another another area that we shouldn't leave it out is actually the loading bay. Okay, you need to reduce the hot air from the external environment. This is very crucial because high humidity level in our country like Malaysia or tropical countries, you know. So the right correct information on your truck sizes, you know, or even the truck heights, whether you want to have a designated kind of uh, truck uh, for certain loading base or you want to share all your loading base, you know, for all the truck sizes. So because the right uh, size of your trucks actually 
this information will enable the right platform height to be constructed. So this will actually correlate to the right size of your dock leveler, to the right size of your sectional overhead door to be used, your dock shelter, you know, whether you will use a curtain type or cushion type or better insulation, you go for inflatable type. Or even you can consider of having all these dock houses or double sectional overhead doors and etc. So this is another key area you have to pay attention to because a lot of energy will lose from here. So, okay, these were wrap-ups on the design and the construction part. But once your, com your core room has commissioned, you know, you start operating. So your door shall be your biggest contributor to energy loss because actually cold air will escape from your core room through the door. But at the same time, you will have hotter air actually infiltrate. So this will create very foggy and misty environment. Your floor becomes so wet, it becomes slippery, and this is dangerous. You no, know, it's like every day you're in Cameron Highlands or Genting Highlands, but this is nice, but this is very hazardous because foggy and misty environment, they are very dangerous. Visibility is very affected. So the rich truck driver can't see you, you can't see them, you see. So it's like when we were young, we always open our fridge door, you know, then our mom will also be starting to yell. So it's the same basic principle. So uh, I would say the suitable type of insulated door is actually very crucial to minimize this problem. You know, besides then you can have all your cold room sliding door, whether it's a manual or whether it's automatic. There's always other options that you can add in, like, you know, the high speed door, whether it's a freezer grade, chiller grade, Besides then all these uh, conventional PVC strip curtains or even these uh, PVC string flex door. Or if you have the luxury of space, you can have the airlock chambers to cut down all these infiltration. So, okay, even the proper heating element for your door area is important. So the floor heater, like floor heater plate on your doorway or these heaters on your door frame and also your door leaf. So this can actually provide protections to the door. So the ice will not build up on this door or on the floor. Because ice build up actually can be very problematic because it really causes improper seal to the door and also slippery uh, surface. And actually ice is actually very damaging to the concrete floor. So uh, I will always, always advise that damaged door, please get it repaired immediately because this will really contribute to the energy loss. And further damage of the door actually it will cost you higher to repair. So I would also say that this will even cause problems to your evaporators. Your, your, your evaporators will actually suffer if too much of hotter air gets to them. You know, ice will actually uh, ice up on the fins, then it reduces its capacity to perform. So I believe uh, Mr. Chu, you also will agree with me on this. So I'll say these are some of the basic fundamentals when it comes to constructing a cold space or facility. So again, I would like to stress that this is where the right materials meet the right methods of insulation and also good workmanship. Besides and all the good planning that how our Mr. Ding has explained earlier. So, okay, thank you very much. So I hope my presentation can be of some help. Johnny, I'm passing back to you. Thank you, Ms. Lim. I'd, I'd, I'd like to uh, just, again, another clarification, if you don't mind. So, so. Again, are you recommending that the panel design should actually interface with the warehouse design at concept stage so that the you're talking about energy loss indoors and what is required in the floor. Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Johnny, uh, in actual fact, uh, before even construction or even during the designing stage, actually there are a lot of information from the specialists, not just insulation specialists, but like the storage system, the refrigeration system, you know, but we need to provide all this information to the related parties like the consultant, like the architects, even the CNS engineer, the ME consultants, and also the builders who build the skeleton of the building. So I would say this is actually a cooperative effort between all the parties in order to get all this uh, work out, but because every project is unique. So no matter how many times we have done it, uh, every project is different. So even they, they actually have to design and consult, uh, construct the building to suit a coal facility requirement. So the construction of a coal room, we always emphasize on the thermal bridges and also the termination of thermal. So whether it's a conventional kind of coal room or ASRS coal room, there, there are a lot of details to be uh, discussed upon. So even there are cases where these uh, existing dry warehouse, where they convert it into coal temperatures facility, 
So there will be limitation on like the heights of the existing warehouse because this will really reduce the number of pallets and because you have become shorter because we have to top up the floor insulation, then the final reinforced concrete floor, then the truss might not be designed for any other loads besides in their own roofing loads. No, I would say this will become a uh, cost implication for the end user if the design, the building type and the construction did not meet the core room specification. You still can actually use it, but then you will affect in the wrong run. Johnny? Hey, thank you very much, Mr. And it's interesting that you, you mentioned, you know, the, the key part of this is, is the storage because that now brings us uh, to the position where I'd like to introduce uh, Vincent Ang, who's from Schaefer, who's going to present optimizing space. So, Vincent, over to you, please. Thank you, Johnny. Hey, um, thanks, Ding, for sharing with us on some valuable info on forum planning in his first session. Um, interesting topic with regards to the outside in and inside out planning concept. Ms. Lim has also shown us how far technology has improved in terms of insulated panel material, as well as the installation method, especially for a cold room with a height of 40 meters. I would like to go through in further detail now for the three options of cold room design which uh, Ding has put together. Um, now we are looking at the, the option one, which is the panel cold room, no doubt. Manual quorum is the cheapest option to construct. However, it may not be as economical as it may sound, especially in the longer term. There are four common areas which continuously causing headache to manual quorum cooperation. Number one, condensation. I'm sure most of you will agree that condensation is the biggest headache in a quorum operation. Just like what Ms. Lim has just highlighted just now, you know, when employees go in and out of a cold room, either by reach truck or pallet pick or hand truck or loose picking, condensation will always find its way into the cold room. Modern technology like high-speed door and airlock room may improve on the situation, but it will not eliminate condensation altogether. This is especially during the peak hour. When moisture leaks in, it accumulates on surfaces like pallet, uh, the racking itself, and the flooring. It creates potential damage to the product, and worst of all, the flooring itself. Because it, it is always a huge challenge to repair the flooring when the operation is in operation, when the core room is in operation. The second challenge is. Microbial, we call it microbial growth in freezer. In a manual facility, a human error happens. This is an example. When a pallet damaged by a forklift, it results in steel. This leads to mold growth, which is a pain to clean. Therefore, it is a great challenge to keep manual facilities clean but it is absolutely necessary to ensure product integrity. High touch handling. I mean, uh, many of us uh, may not be aware that in a manual setting, um, pallet can be easily moved without processes, especially in an operation without a warehouse management system. Operator tends to pick the SKU from the nearest and the most convenient location to him. This leads to first in, first out issue and causing product wastage. Labor is always an essential part of, of uh, overall running cost in the manual core room. Apart from the cost itself, it is also uh, very challenging to get skilled worker due to the working environment in, in, in a core room. High staff turnover is also very common in the manual core room operation. Nevertheless, you know, besides all the common issues that we saw, however, in a manual quorum, there, there are some benefits as well. I mean, this is especially uh, applicable to uh, 3PL, where sometimes there's a change of customer, which results in changes to the ballot size, 
height as well as the order profile. In this case, manual facility tends to have a higher flexibility to accommodate for these changes. In my experience, due to the high cost environment of a forum operation, during the planning, most customers will tend to focus solely on maximizing the storage capacity. Example, by looking purely at high density racking systems such as drive-in and double deep racking. Many tends to overlook on the overall utilization rate of this racking. Example, by putting in drive-in racking to maximize the storage capacity without any consideration of the possible utilization rate during the operation. In a driving racking, I think uh, most of us know that uh, usually same SKU, same batch pallet will be stored in a single lane. Normally, you don't mix SKU. Otherwise, it, it will be even a greater challenge. In this case, new pallet cannot be filled until the entire lane is cleared. This creates redundancy, meaning the location is there, but it is not usable. You know, example, you know, when we, when we prepare a layout for a customer, you know, although, you know, in, in, on paper, it is very impressive. You may be able to get, uh, say, uh, 5,000 pallet location. But in the real operation, if you don't manage your order profile correctly, you know, which result in, in a redundancy in a storage location, location, you may end up with storing only less than 3,000 pallet location. This is not a surprise. Picking efficiency is very often been overlooked too. Example, insufficient pick faces to fit the overall SKU profile. You know, in your operation, you may be running, say, uh, again, you know, 3,000 SKU, but uh, in your actual layout, you may only have less than 2,000 uh, pick faces. So this may result in a lot of pick faces on the upper level. And so meaning you will need to practice what we call a monkey pick, whereby, you know, a picker will have to stand on the reach truck and, and go up to the upper level to pick, or, or either you, just, you have to bring down the pallet to the floor uh, for picking and put it back again, which is very inefficient. Every operation has fast and slow moving SKU. Some SKU are moved in full pallet and some are required to be case picking or human picks. Therefore, I will say there is no single best solution, but they are always the most suitable combination. I, I would like to show you, you know, two uh, classic examples on how we can mix the racking system in order to suit one's uh, operation requirement. On the right screen, you can see here, uh, this is the first example, whereby we can have 80% of fast-moving full pallet pick SKU to be stored in the drive-in. And with a combination of 20% of slow moving case picking SKU to be stored in a selective racking. This is just one example. The second example uh, can be 80% of high density, high SKU product to be stored in either a live, pallet live storage or pushback racking system. And the remaining 20% of less volume but still high SKU product to be stored in a selective wrapping system. Semi-automated forum. Manual to semi-automated process often seen as a stepping stone to a fully automation system. It reduces labor and reap at least some benefits of a fully automated system. Moving to a semi-automated semi-automated system requires good planning and engineering design. You know, we need to review the current processes and flows in order to create value on the investment itself. Most semi-automated facilities incorporate high-density storage systems such as channel storage with pallet shuttle or a mobile racking system. Um, I would like to show you um, one classic example of a semi-automated system, which is a mobile racking system. Um, 
one key benefit of a mobile racking system is uh, that while it is able to increase storage capacity tremendously as what Ding has shown us uh, just now, you know, as comparison to option one and option two. However, at the same time, it still provides you with 100% accessibility of products, which is very important when your operation involves a lot of picking. In this video, you can see, as compared to a traditional selective racking system, mobile racking has a tendency to save spaces of up to 45%. And this will have a tendency to increase storage capacity of up to 90%, depending on your room size. Reactivation of our lighting system just like in this video, reduces energy consumption. The lighting can be controlled to switch on only when one house is open instead of the entire room. Devices such as safety light barrier and emergency stop button ensure the operator will not be trapped within a moving rack. Mobile racking can be combined with a movable sprinkler system to ensure effective fire protection. A prefix smaller multiple hours can be programmed, like in this case, to facilitate pallet truck access or case picking operation instead of opening one big house, you know, I mean, you can, you can program it to open two or three smaller house for case picking. Fan function can be activated during the end of shift to improve cold air circulation. Integration with AGV is also possible with a connection to a WMS or material flow system. I would like to show you an example in this animated video whereby a co room facility with semi-automation may include a self-driving technology such as an AGV controlled with a warehouse management software. In this video, you can see the AGV picks up the pallet from incoming area and put away into a channel storage system. This can be achieved by having a standardized IT interface between the shuttle Fleet controller and the whole system. A similar concept is applicable to a mobile racking system too. In a case picking operation, the AGV picks the pallet from the storage location and deliver it to the workstation. Based on the goods to man principle, the operators are stationary at their own workstation and the pallet is presented to him for picking. The pallet after picking will then be put, up, put away back to the same storage location. This will save the trouble for the picker, you know, by going to the pick phase itself, going to the, 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 the call room for, for case picking. Fully automation makes sense for company that has long-term strategy plan and capital to invest. Very often, both labor issues and energy costs are usually the primary drivers for going to a fully automated system. The main benefits for going into a fully automated uh, forum is number one, energy cost. Having the building upward save energy costs due to a smaller footprint. Not only that, usually an automated call room is equipped with perfectly isolated double airlock system for pallet access. The size of this opening usually is just slightly bigger than the pallet itself. As compared to a manual call room whereby the call room door has to be high enough to allow, allow for bridge truck access. This design keeps the cold air in 
while keeping warm air and moisture out of the freezer room. Labor. Cold room with a fully automated system will not only, of course, you know, save on the, your headcount, your labor cost, your OPEX. Uh, you will also, um, a fully automated cold room will also find it easier to attract labor. It requires a different skill set and normally staff turnover is much lesser as compared to a manual cold room. It is also much safer and it limits exposure to employees. High density space utilization, you know, as you build your cold room up to 30 to 40 meter high, you know, you, you have much higher storage per cubic meter and it results in better return of investment cost per meter square. Mr. Chu will show you the numbers later in terms of power consumption for this scenario. Reckless structure like in this picture saves on construction time and without having to lose big amount of pallet position caused by huge size columns. Another very important uh, benefit of uh, automated forum is safety. With the fully automated quorum solutions, one can expect a more scrutiny on safety perspective. Example, the access to the call room can be limited only to authorized employees, unlike a manual call room whereby you know, anyone can just walk in and out of, of the call room. It is very difficult to control the access. Yeah, whereas in an automated system, you, know, you can easily control. This keeps the product in integrity intact and it limits liability of food safety. It also keeps the employees away from any potential danger by restricting access to potential hazard area. Staging. Staging for route sequencing is possible in an automated environment. This is a very important feature, especially when you have store deliveries. Uh, the route sequencing means that the right order line needs to be loaded correctly for transportation according to the right destination destination sequence. What you really want to have is that, you know, the first drop point, the product for the first drop point to be presented to the truck driver at the end of this, uh, it's nearest to, 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 to the door opening of his truck. So in this case, pallet can be prefixed during the night to a dedicated location. It will then be called in the right sequence in the morning to the delivery truck. For any distribution and warehouse project, it is best to plan for future business growth in the early stages. Proper pre-planning helps lower costs for expansions and retrofits as the business grows. With this, I would like to wrap up my sharing and pass the session back to Johnny. Thank you. Vincent, thank you very much indeed um, for that review of um, optimizing space. Uh, a couple of points, again, I'm, I'm just plucking these out at, as, as we come along here, but my take again here is that you're proposing that the design must be based on operational needs to support the process flow first, capacity second, and let's put the cost to one side third. Is that fair comment to be making? Absolutely, Johnny. In one of my topics just now, if you can remember, um, I touched on the importance of choosing the right storage system. I mean, the right storage system means not only focusing on maximizing the storage capacity only. You know? Sometimes during the, the planning, uh, the customer is not able to fully visualize how their actual operation is going to be like. Therefore, it is advisable to use a more conservative approach by allowing for higher selectivity of racking mix, which will slightly reduce the capacity, as well as allowing for bigger loading and staging area, which will become very crucial during peak hour operation. Okay, all right. Now, thank, thanks for clar clarifying that, Vincent. I, I, I think there'll be some questions coming in for, for all the speakers short, shortly, as I said, I've got one or two that have already begun. But I'd, I'd now like, and, and it is my pleasure,
to hand the floor over to uh, Mr. Chu for, from NRS. And, and he's going to present the, um, the energy savings based on the three concepts. And I'm knowing Mr. Chu as I do, I'm sure he'll expand on that even further. So Mr. Chu, over to you, sir. Have I lost you? Mr. Chu, please come back. I can I can help with some of this uh, the the designs, but you know yours is quite critical to us, sir. Hi. Uh, He's here. I'm, I'm still alive. Don't worry. <laughs> That's good news, sir. That's ah. very good news. <laughs> Hang on a second. Let me turn on my profile. Uh, some difficulties with the with the audio. Now, uh, sorry guys, uh, let, me, let me kind of fix my... Give me a moment here, please. Would uh, you need if you need a if you need a minute or so, Mr. Mr. Chu? That's o that's okay as such. There, I I can um, recap on on the three papers that we've had, or or, or do you need less time than that? Ah, there you go. Ah, okay. okay. I wanted you to see my face and my grey hair, <laughs> and probably the only guy that uh, that has the most grey hair in this uh, forum. I have a lot of highlights, but I'm not I'm, I'm not one color like you at the moment, Mr. Chu. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you, Johnny, for the introduction and all the panelists. And uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, in, in this section, um, we have gone through the earlier panelists about the design concepts, your uh, insulation panels, and how you're going to... Uh, have uh, the type of racking that you want, whether it's mobile racking, static racking, or ASRS, and some automation that you, uh, how much automation you need uh, from the earlier panelists. Uh, I have now the role of uh, keeping it cold for you guys, right? Now, uh, and in order to do that cold, there are some, there are some design considerations that we need to look at uh, because Coal, generating coal requires a lot of energy. It constitutes maybe 70 to 80 percent of your power bill in any uh, refrigerated warehouse facility. So this is an important uh, aspect of how to reduce. And I will show you how how, how design uh, aspects uh, impact your energy bill. Yeah. So uh, if we look at uh, the design considerations that we have. Uh, we look at capacity, reliability, and efficiency. That's the first thing you have. Now that you have your cold stall sizes, your racking arrangements uh, uh, done, and your concept uh, done, we will calculate, we have to calculate the capacity required to cool the facility. Uh, we have to look at how we, what type of uh, reliable equipment that you're gonna have, and how to make the system the most efficient for you. Yeah, in, in this context of uh, reducing power, uh, maximizing space and reducing power, uh, the system efficiency becomes critical now. Yeah? So once you have all that facility all done up, uh, uh, and once we calculated all this, and we have chosen all the right compressor size, system design, and, and, the, and uh, we're happy with all the efficiency numbers and all that, then we go into temperature stability of the room. Now, in order to achieve temperature stability in the room, we also need to look at uh, several considerations, particularly to airflow within the room geometry, which means every corner of the room should not have any warm spots. Yeah? So we need to keep that, that room. And often, we look at the racking design uh, and, and uh, how it impacts uh, temperature stability. Uh, and here's a chart that uh, one of our customers shared with us uh, some years ago. Um, and you can see from the chart, they were maintaining between minus 18 and minus 19 throughout the day with this, with this chart. Yeah? And you can see our, our systems that we put in for them, you can see it's almost a flat line throughout the day. Um, it's flat. 
there is defrost and all that, but you don't see it. Yeah. Now, hang on a second. Here's another chart that one of our customers shared with us, also maintaining at about minus 18, minus 19. You can see the spikes. You can see the temperature spikes. And these temperature spikes are caused by defrost operations. Yeah. So in a cold room, typically today, you don't want to see that spike anymore. You want to, to eliminate the spike as much as you can. So uh, it's very important to have uh, to eliminate this because defrost consumes power, okay? Every time you defrost, you consume power. Your compressors will operate, uh, will work a lot harder. So uh, going forward, we also now have to look at the environmental impact today. Um, you have to decide about the right type of uh, refrigerants you want to use. Uh, you want to have, uh, uh, for example, uh, if you're going to look for HFC refrigerants, please be aware that HFC refrigerants are being phased down. So eventually it will not be available. Uh, and natural refrigerants are making a comeback in the uh, industrial area uh, where not just the natural, it also does not uh, pollute. It does not impact uh, ozone depletion. It does not impact global warming. So for example, ammonia is zero ODP and uh, zero global warming. So it is a natural refrigerant of choice uh, and, and it's been used since the 1980, uh, 1830s. Yeah? So, uh, and with natural refrigerants, uh, you also have very low power consumption. Um, then we look at the expansion and the flexibility. So many of our customers, when they talk to us, uh, we have, we have done static racking, we have done uh, mobile racking, we have done ASRS, you know, we've, we've, we've done uh, quite a few of all these projects together with our customers. And a lot of them look at expansion capability. Uh, it's one of the considerations that they look at. And they also want to look at flexibility today. For example, they want to have dual temperature uh, rooms. They want to convert their rooms between minus 20 or minus 25 and then the next Time they want to use it, they want it at minus uh, plus five or minus five or zero degrees. So that that kind of flexibility can be built into your your refrigeration plant. Okay, um, and then we look at operational aspects. Now, you can you can we can install the state of the art equipment for you today, but operating the cold store is another critical area that you need to look at, which is a, a, a which, which contributes drastically to your, to your power bills. For example, if you have the wrong type of doors, if you have the door in the, you know, if your door entrance is in the wrong location uh, during the, you know, you have, to, you have to mitigate this during the design phase. And that's where all uh, the, the, the teamwork that all the consultants and all the panelists, they are, are here to discuss about. Where do you locate the door? What kind of doors do you, do you want? If you open that door or your operators open that door and try to pull the whole of the neck or follow the pole, it's not going to work, you know? So, you know, so the operational aspects is another key area that you have to look at uh, to, to minimize your, your, your power consumption. And then look at your utility ratchet. Like in Malaysia's context, we have the, uh, the national utility. Our national utility is called the Naga National. Uh, for your facility, they have different rates for commercial, industrial. Uh, so there are different rates and different ratchets that you can use. You can look at renewable energy. A lot of our customers are looking at solar panels today, uh, using solar to, to run their equipment. Uh, you want to consider standby power. If you are a 3PL uh, uh, operator, you might want to look at standby power, which means your gensets. What size gensets do you need to have and things like that, yeah? And the last but not least, the most important is your financials. Uh, once you design everything, you have all your concepts, you have all your uh, refrigeration equipment, you look at that, does it make sense to you at the end of the day? Does it make financial sense to you? Uh, and and uh, if it makes financial sense to you, how are you going to organize your finance and things like that to, to start uh, uh, directing the, the facilities that you need? Yeah. 
So, and going forward again, uh, I'm going to share with you another chart that you look at the temperature trending for the same customer I showed you on the 24 hour. But this chart goes on a week. You know, if you look at the temperature, you can see, that, you know, it goes up and down, but that's a, that's a week of operation. But you can see that the peaks and valleys within the chart is falls between the one degree range. We have also done ASRS for many of our customers. We, we registered at the end of the room or in various parts of the room, we have, have a difference of 0 0.5 degrees Celsius uh, temperature difference, any part of the room. You know, so we have to pay attention to all the details with, uh, with, with designing cold storage. And quite frankly, the devil is in the details. If you don't know what you're talking about, you don't know what you're doing, you're going to get into trouble. Yeah, because in a cold store, once it's in operation, you don't stop. So temperature stability is important. Uh, it helps reduce your energy. And it also, for example, helps your product store much, much longer and safer. Okay. And looking at the three options that the panelists discussed about, I will take you through the three options. The first option is a static racking system with 16 rooms holding 6,420 pallet positions. Uh, and the throughput is about 10 to 20 pallets per truck, which is your speed of operation. Uh, it uses ammonia refrigerant and it takes, it requires about 500 horsepower to run these 16 rooms. Yeah, operating at minus 20. And um, you only need 400 horsepower to run this facility. Okay. And in the third option, this is a 7,257 square meter area. Uh, it is an ASRS, it's one big room plus two small rooms. Um, holding about 15,592 pallet positions. Uh, you can see the pallets, they handle pallets, you can handle about 80 pallets per hour. And uh, you only need about 400 horsepower. So if you look at the three options tied together, uh, the, the, the compressor requirement for the three options uh, are different. And if you, if you look at the storage capacity, the storage capacity increases, you know, from, from a static racking standpoint with the same uh, uh, floor area, um, you, you basically more than double your, your storage capacity from a static racking from option one to option three. You know, option two this is the middle uh, option where you can do, uh, where you use middle, uh, sorry, uh, where you use uh, mobile racking, uh, you can stop. So it really depends on what you need and, and, and how you want to, uh, to optimize your, your space. Uh, and how do you optimize your power? So if you look at, of course, dividing your horsepower to the number of pallets, the lowest is your ASRS option, which is option three. So um, it is very critical that uh, you, you look at how you want to have your system design done. And uh, uh, a lot of times and, uh, uh, the power consumption is a key factor in the decision of uh, getting the best out of your system, yeah, or, or, or your design. Now, the other operation I like to highlight is, if you look at option one, two, and three, if you, you will find that option three, you have more state, more area for staging, which means there's more free area to do your operations, picking, sorting, you know, unloading, and all that stuff. So there is more flexibility in that, in that, in that area, and it's faster. So those of you who are doing 3PL, part of the, your operations would be storage and part of your operations would be uh, uh, handling, product handling, yeah? So uh, with that, I, I would like to end my uh, uh, presentation for this uh, refrigeration portion. Uh, and over back to you, Johnny. Mr. Chu, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'd, I'd like to go back to your your presentation and just clarify a couple of points that that you um, raised as such. There, you you mentioned that certain refrigerants will be phased out. 
and you were talking about um, the, the the uses of other, you know, the, the uses of refrigerants. So when will these be phased out? And um, what is the current cost of the usage of the refrigerants at the moment? Okay. Um, Malaysia is a signatory to the Montreal Protocol and eventually the Kigali Agreement. Uh, so the phase out, uh, right now we are talking to the government about the phase out dates. Potentially we are looking at 2045 to phase out HFCs. Right? So, uh, but having said that, uh, the availability of HFC refrigerants over the years would be impacted because the, the, the producing countries for HFCs will reduce the, the, the production over the years until 2045. So eventually, your cost of refrigerant will go up, right? Uh, cost of HFC will go up. Now, if you compare cost, depending on what type of HFC refrigerants, like 134A or 404A or 507, it can range between a 25 to 35 ringgit per kilo uh, 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 for these refrigerants. Ammonia, for example, would be around six to seven ringgit per kilo. Now, having said that, in a refrigeration plant, if you use ammonia, your mass flow of refrigerant through the system is a lot less, about 10 times less than HFCs. I don't care what type of HFC you have. So your energy consumption and your refrigerant charge using natural refrigerants would be much, much lower. Okay? But having said that, natural refrigerants and any refrigerants have their own hazards. So uh, uh, you have to be aware of the hazards of using ammonia as well as freon, uh, and particularly the new refrigerant that's coming into the market to replace the HFCs. Be very careful with that because some of them are very flammable. Some of them are flammable, okay? All right. Mr. Chu, thank, thank you very much for that. I'd, I'd like to, um, to bring the, the four uh, panelists together now, and I'll, I'll give you my overview and then from there, I'd like you to, to, whether or not you agree with my take of this, or, or would you like to expand on it as such that. From what, from what I see, or what I hear, I should say, your, your, um, your presentations are ten, have a tendency to lean towards um, semi-automated and automated systems go, going forward. And I see that yeah, obviously there's going to be areas there that affect from a financial point of view. So would it be correct in saying that the, the pillars of managing the CapEx and OPEX, that they should be like the business strategy that Mr. Ding mentioned, uh, the design, which you've all mentioned, operational costs where uh, Ms. Lim and, and Vincent uh, uh, mentioned and uh, and also the scalability as you said uh, mr chu we can design anything into well not anything but we can design things into into the system so is that a fair take of of what we've been discussing before we go into the q a mr chu i'll put it back to you again sir oh why me now uh, you're the oldest <laughs> <laughs> right um uh, i think today uh, uh what I'm seeing is the trends in uh, cold storage technology is that uh, it's going towards uh, more automation. We are seeing mobile uh, ranking operations, we are seeing ASRS operation uh, being more and more utilized in the industry. Uh, and uh, I had a customer, one of my customers uh, kind of came up to me and said, hey, I like to have an ASRS system. Can you, can you do one for me? And I, I, had, I had this question for him. I said, um, why would you want to have an ASRS? You know, the investment cost that's going in and, uh, you know, I said, he thought about it for a moment. He says, Mr. Jill, labor is the biggest problem that I have. So that's, that's his answer. Yeah. And I said, okay, we'll build one ASRS for you. And now he's got three, you know. So, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so now and he's looking to expand again. So and he's looking at the SRS and it, it has helped him in terms of having that, that operation with, with automation. He was a traditional static ranking guy, you know, and, and that's how that's how this has developed. And he's very happy with what we have in terms of uh, energy bills 
for his facility. Yeah. Uh, so no. that's that's my basic basic thought about uh, the question. Uh, okay. No, no, no. I'll take like uh, Vincent. Would you agree with that? Okay. I mean, uh, my point of view. Of course, you know we can see the benefits of uh, going into automation. You know, in terms of uh, especially in terms of OPEX and so on. However, um, this uh, may not be suitable for all operation. Especially, you know, we need to look at the scale itself. You know, by going automation, meaning you need to have certain scale. You know, you cannot be like when you design a core room with say five to six hundred pilot position here, you know, we can't put in an ASRS. And also, you see, um, in certain operation, you know, like, you know, I have one of our customer who is actually doing a food, a food wholesaler, you know, I mean, uh, he told me, you know, you can't mix orange and apple within the same room. So they need to have different rooms, like in the, in the case of option one, I mean, it's a must for them. But, you know, unless you are able to overcome these circumstances, like, you know, you're able to store all the product into the same room and also you're able to convince your customer to, to have this, uh, what we call a resource sharing concept. Like, you know, we, we, we store all the pallets, you know, together with our competitors product into the same room, but at the same time, you pass the cost benefit back to them, provided that they agree, then of course, automation is the way to go. So that's, that's my point of view. And, and, and constructing a uh, ASRS, you know, yeah, people are getting into this, but uh, it's, it's not as easy as it, it looks, you see. There are a lot of uh, things involved in building an ASRS because of the height and its complexity, you know, because there are different uh, methods of installation that will be involved. We use a lot of heavy lifting uh, machineries, you know, even different type of uh, insulation materials as well. So even during the construction of a, an uh, ASRS co room, it involves actually a lot of coordination between all these specialists and the builder itself. So, yeah, Johnny. No, 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 I, I can say that. I've got, I've got a, a few questions that have come in as such. There is one, it, to me, it's a very technical question. So I'm going to try and, um, you know, see, see how, how I um, how I can put this together as such. So uh, the question is, what is the common acceptance criteria in validating thermal performance and efficiency of insulated panels, assuming the doors are closed against infiltration? So, um, Ms. Lim, Mr. Chu, is, is this, uh, it's a very technical question, and I know it's a long answer, you know, we, we talk about panels being 100, 150, or 200 thick sizes as such there, but can you enlighten us on that question? Ms. Lim, Mr. Chu? Oh, me again, Ms. Lim. Yes, because you're, okay. the, wizard, mm. you're the wise man. Okay, um, one of the things we do, one of the things we do, uh, the short answer is, when we do our test, the short answer is, when I run the plant, uh, uh, when, it, when, we, when we start the refrigeration plant and get it going, everything is stable, the, the temperatures are good, we tell the owner and we tell the insulation panel supplier, we get them together, tie them to a chair and say, look, I'm gonna do a test. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, the temperatures are in minus 20 or minus 25 or whatever it is. I said, I'm going to switch off my compressors and see how fast the temperature rise without the doors being open, of course. You know, and then from there, we can calculate and determine, you know, if the temperature and the insulation integrity is good. Yeah. And of course, we can use uh, the uh, FLIR uh, uh, infrared uh, uh, Thermal scanning. thermal scanning and do a scan of all the joints and, and the floor and all that stuff and you can see the temperature profile and here's what we also do we also do temperature profiling before we take the project you know we'll, we'll do a simulation of how the airflow will, 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 will perform in the room with the racking with the uh, 
cargo and all that stuff. We'll do a temperature simulation to see how our, our air flows are, the temperature the levels, and then we actually measure. You know, so, so we do validation like that. I'm not sure how many people do that, but you know, we do it like that. And, and we have written the customer testimony and all that stuff, doing it together. Uh, and we do it together with the insulation people. And sometimes they don't like us because we do this. <laughs> But another part of this question is such, and that comes into what you just said as such, but the question is, what is a good benchmark and acceptance, acceptable temperature rise over the time the, re the re refrigeration is in shutdown mode? I have not done, uh, sorry, I have not done a, a sort of a temperature benchmark yet. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, if, for example, if, if your temperature rise of about uh, eight degrees within the day, I think that's too much. Yeah, I'd, I'd add into that in the the few projects that we've been involved in, where we've been been involved with, you know, uh, renovating, and we've had to, uh, shutdowns for that such a. The critical point that we've always come about is what is the product inside the the cold room as such a if it has a, a a minimum temperature of minus 15 or minus 18 or minus 12 to us that is that is the benchmark you cannot go below that figure well so, so I mean, it's very difficult because you know you have a thermal mass of coal cargo in that warehouse so the thermal mass is also going to add into that, that that temperature profile so it's very difficult to measure when you have cargo in the room. What we do is we measure when, we, when there is no cargo in the room. It's purely just insulation panels and wrecking, you know? When, that, that, that's correct. But when you've got the product in the room and you're doing a shutdown for maintenance or whatever period of time, you've got to protect the, you've got to protect the supply chain from there. And, sure, and we, sure. we've always taken is what is the minimum temperature and if we get critical to that point there, we would stop the um, shutdown and, and go back into work. Uh, but th that's, that's the question. So I, I think the, the benchmark has to be to ensure that the product never um, is below its, its minimum temperature as such there in, inside the cold rooms. I've got a question here, and I, it's a clarification. I think, that, I think Vincent, that you've covered this as such there, but uh, the question is, uh, ASRS is not suitable um, when you have high skew and turnover for FMCG. Um, I, I think the answer to that is that sometimes the ASRS can be the bulk storage, and then you can have an area outside where you do the picking and everything else. But the answer to the question is that, ASRS is not suitable for all things. It is suitable for some. Uh, would you agree with that, Vincent? Yeah, of course. I mean, it, it all depends on how we, how we, how we plan the, the, the core room itself. You know, we, we should not purely looking at storage itself. You know, so um, how about the, 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 the picking? Where are we going to do the picking? Are we going to, you know, bring the pallet out and pick one case and send the, send the pallet back? You see, so... In this case, uh, I think perhaps Ding can, can share some light with us based on his experience. I'm, uh, I'm trying. In, in, in other ways, if you ask me about FMCG, it, it, because FMCG is a very, very generic term that when we talk about FMCG, it, 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 it covers a lot. But if you look into FMCG, if what, what your, your thought is that if let's say we, we go into FMCG, it's not suitable for ASRS, I won't. In, in short, I'm not fully agree that it's not suitable for, for ASRS because if you look in, it, it's really a fast moving product. Actually, the ASRS will help in certain extent in, in terms of, if you talk about the part that is main storage that your inventory is keeping at around 30 to 60 days kind of, of inventory holding periods that you have, that will be definitely suitable for, for, for the ASRS. But if you look at what actually your concern will be that FMCG, when we want to do the piece pickings or even that you have FMCG to support the e-commerce, maybe the, the ASRS will not be that suitable. So then we need certain additionals, uh, additional device or additional 
uh, solutions that attach to the ASIs because the ASIs is tackled more for the storage itself. If you have a pallet storage, ASIs will definitely be one of the good solutions for it. But if you're talking about picking that ASI is doing, ASIs were able to do the pallet pickings, but ASIs weren't able to do the case picking or the piece picking. Case picking, maybe you need some things like the mini load ASIs and so. Then case, if you talk about immense picking, we may need another solution to attach it. So it will be a hybrid solution eventually that we build if, within the warehouse four walls that we will be more suitable for your FMCG solutions. Thank you, Mr. Ding, for that. Uh, Ms. Lim, I've got a question here. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's generic, but it does follow on to what you were saying. It says, do automated doors save on power consumption? Uh, I would say it will save on power consumption because the door will automatically actually uh, close or open when there is traffic, you know, rather than they just, if they, if they do not have these automated doors, the door would be just, either they will just open it, you know, because during high traffic, there's no way for the uh, truck drivers or the these uh, rich truck drivers, they, they don't have the time to come down and open and close the door, you know, they don't have the time to do that. So the automated door is actually very useful in terms to, to reduce the power uh, consumption. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chu, I've got another one coming in here. Can you calculate the power consumption of individual rooms? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Can you power calculate... Consumption? Can you calculate the power consumption of individual cold rooms? Yes, of course. How? How? Hmm. Um, well, first of all, I think there are four phases to the calculation. First of all, we need to know your room size. Then the type of insulation you need, right? And then we need to know your door size. What type of doors do you want to have? And then, how much product are you going to store in the cold room? How much product are you going to move within the day? You know, and how much temperature cool down that you need in, in, in the cold store? And then, all the accessories that, that, that is included in the cold store that's operating in the cold store, for example, your room lighting, your forklift, your, uh, uh, you know, your motors, your fan motors, your defrost operation, and things like that. So uh, these are these are things that we are able to calculate, right? Uh, but um, so for individual rooms, we can calculate like that. Uh, for, so we go into either individual rooms or multiple rooms, and these are pretty standard uh, uh, load calculations that we do, uh, and, and uh, that's how we determine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to change this slightly. Um, this question, it, 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 I think. Uh, either uh, Ding or maybe Miss Lib, you can answer it, but please, I do not want to know the company, what the question is, what is the highest cold room storage warehouse currently in Malaysia? Now, is it 10 meters, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 25, 30? Again, I stress, you know, we, we all have NDAs and we all have other bits and pieces here, so I'm not talking about the company. So I'm just talking about the height that we're using over there. So what, is the highest, what is the highest one that you have? Um, You're talking about within Malaysia, right? Within Malaysia. Okay, within Malaysia, as what I know, is around 42 meters. 42. Any, uh, uh, any offers on above 42? Or do, do we agree? But the question... I'm lower. 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 <laughs> lower. Commonly, I'd say this, I, I'm aware of five or six uh, warehouses where we're 30 meters, around about the 30 meters. Uh, you know, 42 uh, is probably at the top end. I know there are some at, you know, certainly at 12, 15 meters, Vincent, would you say that? There's a lot at that height. Yeah, I mean, but in this case, you see, uh, you, you, you have to see whether, are we, are we talking about the, the height of the, ASRS itself or the height of the entire forum. So yeah. there's, there's, there's a gap there, you see. So a, 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 you know, a, I mean, good, a good point, but I, I think for us it would be what is the what is the highest pallet that we're driving at? You mean the 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 the, the Top ASRS level. system itself? Yep. Yeah. yeah, I mean the well, I mean I'm talking about purely cold room, yeah. I'm 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 not oh. comparing with any ambient now. So in Malaysia, we, we have built something like um, 32 meter ASRS. 
Yeah, I mean, this is, this is just the ASRS height. It, it, it's not the panel height. In the cold room, minus 25 degree. Okay, all right. Okay, I've got, I've got some, some more questions coming in. I, I'd just like um, the audience to know this. All the questions, if we do not answer them today, I will have answers for you within 24 hours. So whatever questions are coming in, we will feed off of them. But there's a few here. Uh, these are, I'm, th I'm quite enjoying these questions actually. How is the floor load measured and calculated for compression for, uh, for, for the compressed mobile racking? And now, Vincent, this is a, we've had this a few times. So this is, it's a, it's a very good question. It's a very good question. Yeah, interesting question. I mean, um, yeah, Ms. Lim, you want to? Yeah, yeah. Want to okay, uh, maybe I, I take this question. Fantastic. Okay, uh, okay for the uh, construction of a mobile racking for the floor insulation itself, in actual fact, it has a different configuration of how we lay the floor insulation. It has to be a combination of a high compressive strength floor insulation with the regular floor insulation. Because uh, even the reinforcement for the, uh, the, the uh, slab itself for the floor insulation for the mobile rackings, the rail is different from the regular one. So, so it's, it is different. So I think Vincent, you maybe you can talk about your, how they, they, they embed that, you know, fix the rail onto the structures before they concrete it. Uh, I think the, the main difference, you know, between a mobile rack and a st static rack, of course, you know, uh, static rack is just the base plate sitting on the floor, whereas mobile rack, we have the rails, you know, sim similar to a, 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 a railway track rail, you know, and we have this wheel running on it. So basically, uh, we have all the loads concentrating on the rail itself. So what we need to do is to calculate the maximum load going onto the rails. And then uh, we will provide this figure to the CNS engineer for them to design the foundation correctly, you know, the, the right loading and the right location. Uh, then, you know, then we have this uh, high compressive strength uh, insulated panel, and then the rail will just be sitting on top. So, so it, I, I add think, a little bit about that the 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 mobile rack floor floor loading things are actually like just now Miss Lim says that is actually three layers that for for the for the uh, CNS engineer they need to consider the the basic the base one we call the base slab the most uh, outside one that one is not cold okay on top of that. That one is the first layers that they need to consider. That will that 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 is the part that it will be considered a floor pressure. That everything's on top. How they actually will transfer to the bottoms, and that is where actually your piling will be supporting that 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 the base base slab. Then on top of the base the base slab, you will have insulation panels. Uh, the not insulation panel, the insulation layers where actually you know normally there will be the XPS. That maybe two layers or three layers. You know depends on the thick thickness that they need. And that is another important part that they need to evaluate is that how much actually eventually is that when the top loading press on it, what is the, uh, what you call that, the, the, the compressions that it will happen that because if it's too, it, it compressed too high, that means that the top side, it won't be stable. It may be has some things that they may, they, it won't be not, not that stable. Well, on top of that, you have the, the in, inside where they call the wear and tear layers. That is where actually Vincent just now mentions that your rail will be planted inside that because that is the layers that actually will, will it actually takes most of the direct road from the, the all the rackings which is transferred to the to the rail and the rail that, that layers will need to be and the concrete at that, that layers will also need to be certain grades that they actually for the the discussion will be happens between uh, us and also the, the CNS and some of them they will actually choose to go at that layers, they will choose to go with what we call the um, the steel fiber reinforcement rather than the 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 using the 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 steel the what you call that the the rebar rather than that yeah, see, yeah. steel fiber reinforcement to do that layers because that will actually give them easier life to do that layers on 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 that you know this is this is all some things that they need to consider and that is a discussions between us. You know, either the, between all the parties related, the insulation panel guys, the 
the, the equipment guy, you know, with the consultants, everything we need to discuss and decide, you know, is, is this, this, this is acceptable for your side, your, uh, each of the parties that are involved in, in that area. Then eventually yeah. something, because you also need to consider that if there is M and E powers that need to tap inside, how you're going to do the penetration on floor or, you know, on side wall or whatever, all that will need to be taken into consideration. Right. Thank, thank you, Mr. Ding. I, I wanna, I've got a new, this is a, a, a very interesting one as well. Such a, how does the re refrigeration system maintain the temperature automatically when the traffic of product going in and out is very high and we get doors open and that? How do we do that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, coming, I'm coming down to discipline, but um, you know, what would we say? Any answers I, to that? I think, is there any other question or just this? That will be that. I'm going to I'm going to wrap that up on the last question, um, Mr. Chief, because we're we're over the time limit as it is. Right. But I I would like the um, participants to know that, as I said, we will definitely take all the questions in hand, get the answers to them, and we will we will get that out. I'd like to do that this afternoon if we can. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the question to the question about the you know the the, the door opening and. Uh, 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 and how to maintain the at the, the uh, temperature in, in the cold store, it is extremely difficult. Okay, but uh, if you want to calculate all the room loads from the air infiltration, it will take a tremendous amount of energy. So it is an operational issue that uh, I see many of the cold store operators need to be If you are going to operate the the cold room, like opening the door, is not going to work. You need to control that properly, you know. And uh, 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 of course, with high traffic movement, you have to com compute for the high traffic movement. But uh, uh, again, how much traffic movement it can be calculated, it can be provided for, you know. But in the context of reducing energy, part of this is to take care of your operations. And the biggest part is. If you have this pro this kind of problem, uh, I would I would suggest that you also look at the humidification or dehumidification of the staging areas uh, uh, into the cold store because that's where humidity comes in and that's where it's going to go into the cold store and that's where you're going to get your defrost. And uh, uh, for example, we've done defrost uh, in the earlier examples that I show you that in the flat line we have a defrost. But that customer does a defrost once a day. And we have a customer in, uh, for an ASRS building that does a defrost once in two days with our, with our defrost scheme. Yeah? We, we, we detect ice on the, on the surface of the coil and uh, it does the defrost automatically. It's not time, it, it's on demand. Okay? So that's, that's a key area where, where you, you try to save energy. I'd, I'd like, and, I'd like can to. I, can I add a little bit on, on top of that? Uh, about Very quickly, Mr. Ding. Yeah. You know, normally, if you talk about that, if let's say you build some things like uh, a cold room that, you know, one of the key areas is always the doors that, you know, you how you're going to design. Definitely, the preference is always the less door, the best. We don't want to have too many doors, but definitely you consider about redundancy as well. How you actually, how many, at least two doors. You know, access in and out. You know, if you have two doors, you have the redundancy. Each of it can do in and out. Then you actually is is perfect for you already. The next one is about when it opens. You 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 don't want the 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 straight the direct air inside air, which is the free freezing air, will able to mix with the external air, which is maybe the chill or even outside. You know, when you have that, that is where actually a lot of times you will put in something we call the air interlocking design, where you have two doors. One opens, the other. Will, will definitely be closed, then the only the other will open. Then this one is closed completely, or only the others will open. So that in, in automations where, like earlier, Vincent also mentioned a good about that is that when you have that those kind of design, you your your door door openings will be the smallest. You 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 just need slightly bigger than the door, and you can consider your, your opening times is definitely in time because all those are controlled uh, automatically. Timing by the, the, the PLC or the or the control systems. When you open the pallet will after it enough for the pallets to move, it will move. 
After it clear, it will definitely close, then only the other will open. That is how actually you are able to maintain inside the cold rooms that all the air won't be mixed up with external. That will help you to solve a lot of problems. Right? Okay, Mr. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chu would like to do that. Um, have we sorted out the, the survey form? Is that anywhere? Because I don't have that. Uh, were we able to do that? Yeah. Um, and I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to... Uh, to tie this all up now and, and, and thank the participants. Uh, we had over 100 people um, listening to us this, this morning. I'd like to thank the, the, the four speakers. I think you did a very good job. And I apologize that we did get through all the questions, which leads me to finish by saying, Mr. Chu, we're 100% correct. We should have, just have a question and answer um, uh, webinar and I'm sure we'd be able to fill the time up with just questions and answers in the future. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your time. Oh, one last thing, I've been asked, can we share the slides? I know we're doing this on YouTube, but can we share the slides? Is that acceptable? Can we do yes, that? Yes, we can. Yep. We can. So we'll, we'll send that I'm out. I'm sharing the slides. I have only three slides. You've got three slides? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chu, for 32 years, of experience, you only had three slides, please. <laughs> okay, everybody, thank you again very much. Uh, uh, Johnny, are we going to do the, the poll session now, or can, can you get the participants to do the poll session? The cold session. The polling session, yeah. The polling session. If we if we can do it now, fine. Uh, yeah, yeah. Why don't we do it? Uh, uh, can we do that? Hang on a second. Give us a Don't second. worry. Would appreciate if all of you can fill up the poll and uh, we can see it right now. Right. So you just want them to uh, click on there. Yes, no. Yeah, just click on there and then we can share with everybody to see. Yeah. Why is it? Sorry, mine has stopped sharing as well. We, may, I think, we'll. Uh, Oh, just just click on the poll and see what what the polls. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, it's it, it's yeah, definitely not you, working. You're not able way. to click. Mr. Mr. Chu, I think what we can do here is that we can we can put another poll out individual from okay. the team and such there and put it from there. Ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you very much indeed for your time. Uh, as we say this day and age, be safe. And um, hopefully COVID will be behind us by the end of this year. Thank you very much, everybody. Good thank day. You guys. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Okay, bye, -bye. Sorry, a bit slow at the beginning, but you know, we got that.